Congress has not yet approved an agreement to address the DACA program, that's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. You've probably heard at least some of the news about DACA. This week, the Supreme Court sent a case back down to a lower court instead of ruling on DACA. There's a lot of uncertainty now about what will happen in the courts and what DACA recipients should do as they wait. Producer Sarah Gustavus sat down this week with an attorney and a member of the New Mexico Dream Team this week. I'm joined in the studio this week by Adriel Orozco, an attorney at the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And Carla Molinar Arviso, Communications and Advocacy Fellow for the New Mexico Dream Team. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Adriel, I want to start with you. First, the Supreme Court uh, declined to accept a case this week that dealt with DACA. For non-lawyers, what does that mean? Well, so the Trump administration had appealed um, a decision by a San Francisco court. So the San Francisco court had an issued an injunction, a nationwide injunction, requiring the government to continue to accept DACA renewal applications. Um, and so the federal government did the unusual move of trying to jump over the Court of Appeals and go straight to the Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court decided not to take up the case. And uh, it seems like one of the reasons was because um, the Trump administration decided not to actually ask the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court to hold off on that injunction, uh, which is called a stay. And so uh, it seems like the, court, the Supreme Court believes that the Court of Appeals can expeditiously, expeditiously move forward with the case. So it seems like they, they believe that the Court of Appeals can go ahead and move forward quickly enough, especially because the government didn't ask for an emergency stay in the case. We have this March 5th date out there. What's, what's the importance of that day? So in September of last year, when the Trump administration announced the phasing out of the DACA program, is, uh, they announced that March 5th would sort of be that cutoff date for renewals. And so uh, that, that date was sort of supposed to be used as a leverage point for Congress, for Congress to act, right? It would be sort of that last day. And uh, because of the January injunction by the San Francisco court, also there was another injunction requiring the government to continue to accept DACA renewals that was issued in February by a New York court. Um, that deadline sort of doesn't really mean anything anymore. Um, but what it does mean is that, let's just say through the court of appeals processes, so the Trump administration has also appealed the New York case to the second uh, uh, circuit court of appeals. It just means that if there's a decision in those cases, it can abruptly end DACA. And so um, essentially before we had sort of this cutoff deadline and now it's just sort of waiting to see what happens in the courts. When you say abruptly end, does that mean people who had DACA protection now, it would go away overnight? Um, so it's unclear how it would end. Uh, even before on September 5th, when we were expecting an announcement by the Trump administration, we didn't really know how they would do that. And uh, it might be that the courts determined that the cases are, uh, that DACA was unconstitutional. So then it could potentially abruptly end the program. Um, it could just uh, determine that they are constitutional, but the government has the right to end them in the way that it wants to end them. Um, and so currently that would mean that anybody who had DACA would continue to have DACA until it expired. So it's just really unclear and it really depends on those, um, on those orders from the judges. So there's just a lot of uncertainty moving forward beyond that March 5th deadline. I think one big question that comes up a lot is why don't young people who have DACA protection just get naturalized? So uh, for folks that don't know, naturalization really just means getting U.S. citizenship. And DACA was actually created because there aren't a lot of avenues for folks to be able to apply for legal permanent residency. So uh, one thing that some folks might not know is that you have to get a green card before you can become a citizen. And so if you don't uh, have a U.S. citizen family member, um, like a spouse, um, or if uh, you enter without permission, um, or let's just say, uh, various reasons you don't you don't have a high skilled job you don't have money to invest a lot of money in the United States you, you know they're very limited ways to become a legal permanent resident and so uh, DACA was really um, attempting to create a, a path for stable status of, in some sense for folks so the United States hasn't had a, a real change in immigration law since around 1986 um, in 1996, they criminalized a lot of, of actions by, by uh, immigrants, but remedies really haven't changed in quite some time. And so that's why, you know, there was a lot of pressure on the Obama administration to do something because Congress for 
decades hasn't done anything. And so um, the, what that means is that folks who are currently in the United States just don't have any avenues to actually get to a path to citizenship. This, this uncertainty, um, living with this uncertainty of not knowing what's going to happen next, what does that mean for people who have DACA in New Mexico? So uh, as Adriel was saying, is um, the situation of people that have been here since they were young, that have that know what it's like to be dehumanized, that it's not that, that know what it's like not to have an identity. That DACA, to, to a, a large extent, was able to provide for young uh, undocumented immigrants that have lived here all their lives. Um, this situation with DACA has has provided a lot of uncertainty. Um, a lot of people have pursued professional degrees. Uh, in the state of New Mexico, we have uh, a young undocumented woman who was able to receive DACA, uh, and she graduated from law school. And her admittance into the bar uh, was contingent upon her DACA uh, permit. But her DACA is set to expire in about, I think, of, I believe, less than 60 days. Uh, so because of the way that uh, DACA has been put in limbo and the program and the continuation of who can benefit or not, uh, a lot of lives are in limbo uh, because people do not know if they can continue uh, with their professional careers, whether that be lawyers, teachers, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, but more importantly, uh, a very real impact that it has is that we are seeing a massive increase in deportations and targeting of immigrant families and youth, especially now that we know that we don't know what Homeland Security is going to do with the information of DACA recipients, uh, where they have their addresses and where to find people. Uh, so one of the biggest uncertainties is how are these people or how are undocumented immigrant youth and their families going to live now that the one option that we had fought for so long, the one tiny solution that we had come up with in the midst of lack of action by Congress, was it going to happen to them now that not only is the political climate changing, but that the government is also ending this program, it, or it seems like it's ending this program and putting all these people and their families in limbo. Uh, so. It's, it's difficult uh, because it, it's changing, it's playing with people's lives. Yeah. Uh, yes. It sounds really emotionally difficult to say, okay, I'm gonna try to finish my school, keep up with things, or, or try to you know, keep pursuing my professional goals without knowing what's gonna happen next. Do people come together on the Dream Team and talk about those challenges for them personally? Yeah, so I think, uh, in fact, a lot of our members did not even get to qualify for DACA. And that's another reality. Uh, undocumented students who, um, who had very similar backgrounds to documented people, but because of very arbitrary, again, deadlines, uh, were not able to qualify. And the reality is that, um, and, and that's also a strength that uh, the immigrant community has, is that it's able to find ways to continue. Um, for example, schooling is different for undocumented students and DACA students. There's a lot less uh, financial resources available, which is the reason why, in fact, I believe only 3% of undocumented students that graduate from high school are able to graduate college. Um, so uh, the reality is that people continue to make the best that they can with what they have, but it is very difficult with having limited options um, for, for work, for continuing their education, uh, but also how do they maintain their livelihoods in the meantime while they get an education or, or whatever they have to do? Adriel, does this sound like the clients that you work with, they're experiencing those challenges? Oh, definitely. You know, um, when the DACA decision to, to rescind came out in September, um, we, we did DACA clinics across the state working with the Dream Team. So we went to Farmington, Taos, um, we did a, a DACA-thon for 12 hours in Albuquerque, um, and I know that you guys went to so many other places as well. And um, people were just really uh, just scared or uncertain as to what would happen um, if they weren't able to renew. Uh, it was really just uh, heartening when you had to tell, tell somebody that they actually didn't qualify to renew because their DACA expired after March 5th of 2018. So people can't renew early and get ahead right um, They currently can. Mm -hmm. Again, uncertainty created by all these uh, court cases, by the Trump administration, by Congress. Um, so currently anybody who has had DACA can renew. 
if they have never had DACA, they cannot apply for it for the first time. Mm. So that is a thing. There are several cases actually that are still pending in Maryland, in Virginia, in DC, that uh, might actually bring up the issue about initial DACA applicants. Um, but these two injunctions have only uh, applied to those folks who had DACA. So currently only the government's required to accept DACA renewals. Um, but yeah, look, we had individuals whose DACA had expired prior to September 5th who just couldn't come up with the money. Right. And so uh, we've heard of employers who are just who really want to like, keep their uh, employees, but they're uncertain about whether they can continue to employ somebody, even if the person has work authorization. A lot of small businesses don't even know uh, what that process is of like how to verify uh, the employment, um, employment authorization of these individuals. And so <clears throat> it's, it's creating uncertainty, not just for immigrants, but for the entire US economy, for like schools. So in the San Francisco case, the University of California was one of those parties that sued. And they're saying, look, you know, we're gonna be impacted negatively. Our students are gonna be impacted. Our staff is gonna be impacted. Um, cities and counties also were joined in that case because it's just the, the level of uncertainty is, is just across the board, even for folks, uh, for institutions um, that work with these individuals. And so you would think that Congress would be pressured to act much more than just uh, allowing one week of debate on, uh, on bills, right? Yeah. Carla, how is the New Mexico Dream Team advocating for DACA recipients right now? What, what kind of work are you doing? So, um, so I'm not sure if a lot of people know this, but the, the idea of DACA didn't come from the White House at the time. It came from uh, immigrant advocates, organizers, and activists, uh, including a, a group of immigration lawyers and community members that were like, okay, it's been 16 years and nothing has done, happened in Congress. Uh, let's come up with a solution that, uh, an executive order that the president can take to protect us while Congress takes action. Um, so that was a, a community victory, really. And uh, currently our next step has been, okay, we have one Band-Aid solution. The next thing is, at least if we cannot have a comprehensive immigration reform, a, a DREAM Act to protect immigrant youth who are in limbo right now. Um, so. For the past year, it's been it's been a, a crazy ride. It's been it's been chaotic, but it's also been very empowering. Uh, we engaged in a campaign and a national effort um, that was fought both locally and in D.C., uh, where we tried to get our representatives and senators to co-sponsor a Dream Act. Uh, at the time, we were asking for a Clean Dream Act, which meant that uh, we want a legislative solution that protects immigrant youth but we wanna take away the idea that to protect some immigrant communities, you have to hurt others, which is the political game that is being played in DC right now. Um, being pit, uh, pitting either TPS holders against, or uh, temporary protect, uh, protected status recipients against uh, uh, undocumented youth or dreamers, uh, diversity visa people, uh, recipients against uh, dreamers again. And so what we've, uh, been doing in the past six, seven months is we've been going to DC on a series of, um, of actions. Uh, and it actually started on September 5th when the administration of President Donald Trump announced that DACA was rescinded. Uh, we had 2,000 people march out from high schools and universities all across the state, where including the internment president uh, of UNM walked out. Uh, letters were sent from UNM president, uh, uh, LMA, uh, Highlands University, uh, saying that we need DACA. We need, uh, and more importantly, we need a permanent solution because DACA is not enough. So starting with that, it was a massive walkout, uh, and it culminated in, it continued uh, into we took a bus of 200 people to DC. Uh, to let Congress know that they need it to get to work and they need to pass a, re a solution. But more importantly, uh, has been developing tools locally, uh, whether that is we develop a hotline for people to report uh, ICE activity in their localities, because we are seeing a lot of it now, and as well as passing immigrant-friendly resolutions in counties, as well as uh, memorials or symbolic says in our state legislature, which is uh, a memorial to protect uh, human rights and civil rights, regardless of status, citizenship, uh, uh, orientation. Yeah. 
Ariel, do you have one final comment you want to make? Advice you have for, for clients and their families right now? Yeah, so um, the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center actually has programs uh, in schools uh, across Albuquerque. And the idea that we actually started getting into those schools because we wanted to make sure as many students as possible that qualified for DACA can get it. Especially because even though in our state uh, um, students can get in-state tuition if they're going to college um, uh, and the lottery scholarship, that a lot of them were misinformed or um, also just didn't see the value of going to college if they didn't have work authorization or, or more stability in their lives. And so we started getting into schools for that reason. And uh, what we saw actually is that there are a lot of youth who don't have, uh, who are not living with both of their parents. So they've been abandoned or neglected by one of them. And so there's a status called special immigrant juvenile status um, that youth can actually apply for that actually gives them a path to legal permanent residency and then to citizenship and quite unfortunately uh, once the the uh, student uh, no longer is a minor or graduates high school then they're limited and no longer can actually qualify for that so one thing is that i would definitely encourage students or family members or even educators um, who are watching to really um, either reach out to us or um, really just try to learn up around SIJS so that uh, a lot of youth don't miss the opportunity that they have to actually get some stable status. You know, there's a lot here. We'll put some resources on our website. And thank you both for coming in this week to talk about what's going on right now um, with DACA. I know it's complicated, but we appreciate your, your insights you were able to offer today. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Yes.